Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Royal Society of Edinburgh this morning, to this gathering of the Asia Scotland Institute. Um, and we're absolutely delighted that the Minister, Lord Green, is with us today. In the closing months of his role, which uh, on December the 10th he will hand over um, and move on to other things, no doubt. This is part of the ongoing programme, and I'm immensely grateful to a number of individuals and companies for supporting us, that really is designed to deliver, through our mission, a programme that will equip tomorrow's leaders in Scotland with the knowledge and the skills to engage effectively with undoubtedly the most important markets in the world. And to do so not for the first time, but to do so because we aim to reignite through these programmes what is already in the DNA of the Scot. Because those of you who haven't heard me say this before should know that if you are a Scotsman, your forebears, or Scotswoman, quite remarkably for a country which is half the size of London, traveled all over the world and had a huge impact as bankers, administrators, soldiers, and engineers. And we believe, and the International Advisory Council, and there are members here of that council and our trustees, that it is possible to make this happen working with the great universities and working with companies. Now in the corporate sector, of course, much of the corporate sector is made up of small and medium-sized enterprises in Scotland. And I know that Lord Green is going to address that as he speaks to us today about what those SMEs should do and what the opportunities are for them. You probably know that he was appointed the Minister of State for Trade and Investment in early January 2011, and as such is responsible for trade and investment. And he sh this role is shared between the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. Lord Green began his career, actually, with the British government's Ministry of Overseas Development. So, speaking as a, an executive search consultant or headhunter, I can tell you he's pretty well qualified for the job he's been holding. And in 1977, he joined McKinsey and Company, management consultants, with whom he worked in Europe, North America, and the Middle East. He joined HSBC in 1982, where we first met, uh, when he had responsibility for corporate planning and then the development of the bank's global treasury operations. And he became group treasurer and then subsequently moved on to run the treasury and capital markets businesses globally and was later CEO and chairman. In summary, a man who knows what he's talking about, and we're very glad that what he's going to talk about, he's going to share with us today. Steve, thank you. Roddy, thank you very much for those rather too generous words of introduction. And uh, it is indeed a long time since you and I first met um, when he was touting for business with HSBC, <laughs> uh, which he won. Um, uh, and his opening remarks remind me of a couple of things that are relevant to uh, Scotland and Asia. One is, of course, that uh, there were so many Scottish traders, entrepreneurs, uh, administrators and others fanning out around the world, um, and indeed HSBC itself uh, was founded amongst others by a couple of uh, Scots in the 19th century, and as some of you may know, was for a long time known as the home for Scottish, uh, Scottish bank clerks. Um, he, you also mentioned Adam Smith, of course, another famous uh, son of Scotland, um, who I heard the Prime Minister of China quoting, um, not the current one, the previous one, at a Davos uh, a couple of years back, um, on the theory of moral sentiments. So that goes to show that Scottish influence in Asia is at many levels uh, and long deep-rooted and long-standing. Um, and if there's a uh, challenge of reigniting that or uh, exciting the next generation about Asia, uh, well, it's one that I'm happy to try and rise to. Um, because uh, Asia is the big uh, historic fact about the 21st century, uh, the shift of the centre of gravity of the world's economy, uh, which I think we're all familiar with at the level of statistics and just as a general proposition, um, is uh, underway. Uh, the financial and economic crisis so far from derailing it or slowing it, if anything, accelerated it. Um, and uh, for reasons that I want to go on to explain for a minute or two, uh, this will continue for the next generation. And therefore, it poses a challenge and an opportunity for all of the economies of Europe, um, uh, all of the governments of Europe, um, and also all individuals and businesses, uh, because uh, it creates 
both potential threats for sure, but also immense opportunities. And I want to elaborate a little bit on that, and particularly by reference to one of the most interesting parts of Asia, which is ASEAN, the Southeast Asian nations, um, uh, for reasons I'll come back to. Um, this shift of central gravity is taking place um, because there's a great convergence going on in the world. It's not, there's nothing actually mysterious about it, and it should, of course, be celebrated. In the year 1820 or thereabouts, the largest economy in the world was China, and the second largest economy in the world was India. Because at that time, roughly speaking, the size of your economy as a proportion of the total world economy was the same as the size of your population as a proportion of total world population. It was only later on, firstly the British, and then the Germans, and then the Americans, and then other Europeans, and the Japanese, that underwent an urbanization, a modernization, an industrial revolution, which for the first time in human history created societies where uh, the average income per head was above, above subsistence level, um, and the, uh, a, 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 a rising middle class could enjoy the fruits of that and start to create the sorts of standard of living that we take for granted. But what is now happening is a great catch-up, a great convergence, as a, a whole series of other countries around the world start to enjoy the benefits of the same phenomenon of rising incomes and all that follows from that. What triggered this? Um, well, the economic, economic historians will write, no doubt are already writing books about this in 50 years' time. I think they will write probably more considered historical uh, uh, um, assessments of what happened, but roughly speaking, around 1989 and thereabouts, you had, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the opening up of China, the first wave of serious reform in India. You had a whole series of events that roughly, uh, largely came together to create a new uh, uh, incentive towards a trading drive behind economic activity and, an, and a, and a an internationalizing dimension to it all. And then on top of all of those phenomena, the rise of the digital uh, society, the digital revolution, made it all the more easy to do this. So, as I say, that's the stuff for economists, both now and uh, over, over the next couple of generations. The fact is that the result is a huge growth in these economies in throughout Asia, uh, in the Middle East, because one of the happenstances of geography is that Asia, which is a great industrial powerhouse, is short of natural resources, particularly short of hydrocarbons, and therefore the big suppliers of hydrocarbons, notably in the Middle East, have been big beneficiaries of this Asian drive, and that has also swept through into Latin America and into Africa, and we are probably no more than halfway through this extraordinary transition. It will go on, I would suggest, for the next generation, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we've seen in the last few weeks signs of some temporary stumblings of some emerging markets, temporary coolings down, worries about whether the bloom is off these markets. I was at a dinner last night with some financial services people, um, investment managers who worry about the fact that the emerging markets may be now entering into a period of much slower growth and all the rest of it. This... Uh, could well be true, it's a short-term phenomenon and not a long-term one. The long-term facts are driven by the basics of demography and the need for modernization or the drive of modernization. As countries modernize, they always urbanize. There is no known exception to that rule. And a place like China is probably halfway through the transition at the moment. You've seen maybe 500 million people move from rural economies uh, in China and various parts of China into the cities. There are probably 400 to 500 million more who will move over the next generation. Same is true for India, same is true for Indonesia, uh, and of course, when you look at Africa, a, a continent which is coming to more and more focus now, um, uh, the, 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 the transition has even got even further to go. And indeed, uh, at the moment, seven out of the ten fastest growing countries in the world, and it's not just a flash in the pan, this has been true for the last five years, are African. So although there are some short-term difficulties that are uh, uh, concentrating the minds of investment managers, I don't think we should lose sight of the long-term phenomenon, which is this shift to the centre of gravity as 
Asia in particular, but also Latin America, increasingly Africa, take their place on the world stage economically. This will also, of course, change the political balance because so many questions are economic ones at root, even if they appear as political ones. And one of the clearest signs of the change that has taken place is the rise of the G20, uh, the way in which the G20 has, you might say, marginalized the role of the G7, G8. The time was when a group of rich, developed countries, the G7, uh, would, would conclave to discuss the world's economic problems and then uh, uh, let the rest of the world know what the solutions were. Uh, that's, that time has now gone. Uh, I don't mean by that that therefore the G8 has no role to play. It certainly does. Uh, but undoubtedly, the real focus for attention, and it's this coming week, of course, is on the next meeting of G20 in St. Petersburg, and the membership of the G20 tells you much of what you need to know about the economic uh, sources of influence in the modern world. There is no reason to decry this uh, or, to, uh, or to bemoan the loss of uh, that relatively uh, dominant position of the G8 markets, yes, they will lose share economically in most markets around the world. That doesn't mean to say they're going to go down absolutely, of course. And the more exciting truth is that as this happens, there are going to be a great deal of opportunities for those who are prepared to be flexible and adjust and take account of what is going on in the wider world and plan accordingly. And the reason why that's true is that in all economies, another, uh, I think, universal of economic development, well, actually, that's not so true, but left to itself, economic development is not autarkic. And all of the signs are, whether it's China or India or Indonesia uh, or Vietnam, uh, that as countries develop and as their middle classes develop, two or three things happen. The first thing that happens is that a middle class, as it develops, starts to demand the same kinds of goods and services that we all take for granted. So lo and behold, they're interested in air conditioning, uh, cars, uh, mopeds first, and then cars. Um, they're interested in fashion goods. They're interested in travel, tourist travel. They're interested in healthcare and insurance services and a whole series of activities, goods and services, uh, that the Europeans have taken for granted and which the Europeans are really rather good at doing. And wherever I go, and I've been to some 55 countries in this job, and I travelled pretty extensively in my previous one uh, in Asia, um, you see the same thing. You see uh, shopping malls in big cities with brands that we're all very familiar with showcasing their wares and doing great business. I was in ASEAN um, back in the summer. I did seven ASEAN countries in 10 days, nearly on my knees at the end of it, I must say. But uh, uh, and in fact, I'm going back to another one, the Philippines, um, uh, the week after next. And the reason for focusing on ASEAN um, in these remarks is because ASEAN, I think, is a very interesting phenomenon that probably needs a little bit more attention than we sometimes give it, because when we talk about Asia, we immediately start talking about China and India. And I want to talk about other parts of Asia. Um, not because China and India are not important, of course, but just because I think there's something very exciting happening in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, as the ASEAN countries, there are 10 in number, uh, in total are 600 million people. Uh, and in a generation's time, it'll be over 700 million. They have ambitions to gradually pull together a common trading block. They, interestingly, look to the European Union to learn some lessons. And I don't just mean negative lessons. They actually admire the European Union for what it's achieved. Come back to that. If uh, not in my remarks, then perhaps in discussion. Um, uh, they have very ambitious aspirations, which I actually don't think they will completely succeed in realising, at least not in the timetable they've got in mind, because uh, their timetable has the creation of a common economic market by the end of uh, the year after next. Well, it's taken the European Union 60 or so years to get to a rather imperfect single market, so I suspect it will take ASEAN a bit longer. Nevertheless, the willpower is there, and to the extent that they succeed, they're going to become a formidable economic block on the world stage. And even without doing anything much different from what they are now, their average growth rate is over 5%. They range all the way from one huge country, Indonesia, to uh, a couple of very small ones, uh, Brunei, Singapore. Um, 
and they range across the spectrum of economic development. I think in Singapore, you, you mentioned that you've got an upcoming event. Singapore, I don't think, could describe itself as an emerging market any longer, not meaningfully. This is as developed as they come. Uh, a very successful market. I, I dare say many people in this room know Singapore very well. Um, I first went in 1983. I've seen a few changes over that period of time. Um, it is a, a phenomenally successful, adaptive, uh, small city-state that has been able to find its way into some very successful market niches in the modern world. And they're never satisfied with what they've done, uh, so they're always striving to continue to modernise themselves. Uh, they will remain a phenomenon, or they will be a phenomenon, in a whole range of sectors, in, in financial services, obviously, in professional services, in uh, life sciences, in high-tech aerospace. And they have very considerable ambitions. So that's one end of the scale. Um, at the other end of the scale, you have Burma, Myanmar, that, uh, again, Roddy mentioned, uh, which, was, which was the last port on my call. Uh, um, and uh, there you have a country emerging from a military regime, uh, a closed society, very backward, needing almost every conceivable uh, area of support and expertise that you can imagine. 60 million people, so it's roughly the same size as Thailand, roughly the same size as, uh, as, um, as yes, it's Thailand, um, and, uh, uh, and, and having a long way to go uh, as it seeks to come in from the cold into the, the mainstream. Many problems to solve, including some human rights issues which we're aware of from the better media coverage that it's now getting. Um, but, uh, but again, an extraordinary determination uh, that I believe will see them through, and uh, uh, we'll see what happens. So that you've got all the way from Burma, uh, Laos, by the way, which I didn't visit, but again, would, be, would, would, would I suspect have a long way to travel. And at the other end of the scale, Singapore, you've got a very large country, uh, Indonesia. You've got the Philippines, which I'm going to the week after next. Uh, you've got Malaysia, another country which is, is st still emerging in some senses, but also well on the track towards a very uh, prosperous-looking uh, society in many ways. Um, and this collection of nations is in a strategically significant part of the world. Uh, Indonesia has got considerable natural resources, um, uh, so by the way is Burma. Um, and uh, so they're, they're also very conscious of their geopolitical strategic position, uh, at the kind of the crossroads between China, India, Australia, um, uh, looking to the Pacific in one direction, Indian Ocean in the other direction. This is going to be an area of the world that we need to pay attention to, um, and the opportunities are very large. Vietnam, uh, the second largest country in ASEAN, bigger than most of us think it is. I've often tried the simple test at a dinner party of saying to people, how big do you think the population of Vietnam is? And most people, I think, have got in their minds that it's sort of the size of Thailand or even of South Korea. So 40, 50, 60 million. No, it's 90 million people. If it were a European country, it would be the biggest country in Europe. Um, and there's a country with real determination to, uh, to, to, uh, to achieve essentially what their big neighbours to the north have achieved. They look to China um, and see this is what's happened in China over the last 20 years. We're probably 15 years behind, I think that's right, um, and they are determined to kind of achieve that same momentum. And they look to Britain as a source of real um, support. They, uh, every country that I've been to, this is true more broadly than ASEAN, and it's certainly true in ASEAN, I find that our market share is lower than it could and should be. Uh, we are behind the Americans, you might not be surprised by that. We're behind the Germans, you might not be surprised by that, given their prowess in capital goods and in premium cars. Uh, but we're also behind the French and the Italians. I don't really see why that should be true. Um, and it tells us uh, that there are some opportunities that we are missing. Furthermore, uh, there isn't a single one of them where you have to beat the door down to get a voice for Britain. Um, because actually everywhere, uh, what they see Britain as standing for is high technology, creativity, integrity of doing business, um, a long-standing attachment to at least some parts of, the, uh, parts of that world, not so much Vietnam, but certainly a place like Malaysia, um, and a 
a, a real sense of the creativity and delivery that Britain is capable of across a broad range of sectors. When I was in Vietnam, I called on three ministers, including the Prime Minister, every single one of whom has got their children being educated now at British universities, north and south of the border. That tells you uh, that there's a real uh, appetite for doing more business with Britain across a wide range of activities. The other big fact about those countries, as more broadly uh, through the emerging markets world, is infrastructure investment. They've all got plans for new airports, new power su uh, supply, uh, urban development, transport, ports, you name it. Uh, they are rolling out plans for uh, ambitious infrastructure development, which are driven by their own economic growth. It's not in the least bit surprising. It's exactly what the textbooks would tell you to expect. And the opportunities in those areas of investment for a wide range of British activities, whether you think of the British architects, which, uh, who are so prominent around the world, when you think of British, British professional services, uh, financial services, the law services. I was with the Scottish Law Society this morning talking about the opportunities for Scottish law around the world. Uh, whether you think about um, engineering, <coughs> and uh, creative industries, uh, um, traffic planning, crowd management, all these kinds of things that go with urban development. We've got things that they need, and they need them big time. And so in the first, uh, if the first breath is how delighted they are to see us, then the second breath is why don't they see more of us? And in every country that's true. They see plenty of Americans, Germans, French, Italians, as I mentioned, are not enough British companies of all shapes and sizes. This brings me on to my final point, then I'm going to stop, which is the importance of smaller British businesses. We have some very big household names who, who, who are prominent around the world, the, the oil majors, uh, a bank I can think of, a couple of banks I can think of, um, some insurance companies, uh, Rolls-Royce with their major new facility in Singapore, uh, JCB. These, these names are well known around the world and they know their way around. The challenge for us, I believe, collectively, is to support smaller companies, whether it's in the supply chains of those big companies or whether it's just independently, in taking that first step out of the known into the unknown. Whether the known is the domestic market here in Scotland, here in the UK, or whether they've already expanded you know, into Ireland or across the channel into Belgium, taking that next step into these exciting markets that are further away, in some ways more unknown, and yet there lies growth, not merely for the next year or two, but for the next generation. There lies a way of uh, um, helping them grow, helping them create jobs, helping them improve their productivity and their product range, uh, because one of the surest facts about exporting, it's demonstrated time and time again in academic surveys and in uh, there's a very good survey done by the Department of Business in London, actually. It all shows the same thing. Companies that get into the export markets become significantly more efficient than the ones that don't. They do grow faster. They do create more jobs. And in a way, it's not surprising. Yes, because you're embarking on a world scene where there is a bit more competition. And it does kind of force you to, to sharpen up the act. And in so doing, you realize, yes, I can do. And I've got some real world-class excellence to bring to bear. And then I get the growth. Is it risk less? No, of course it's not. Is it the way that there is real opportunity over the next generation? Yes, it is. This country is going to go relatively slowly. The rest of Europe is going to grow relatively slowly. Uh, almost my final kind of um, unbreakable law of economic development is there comes a point when countries slow down. And that's true of Europe and is going to remain true of Europe. These other countries that have not yet reached that stage of convergence are still growing rapidly and are going to go on doing so for some considerable time. You will see, in the case of a country like Singapore, the beginnings of the slowdown. They're beginning to mature. They're beginning to exhibit exactly the pattern that you see in Europe. But there's so many other places where there are so many opportunities which are so broadly based across every sector that you can think of. And the welcome for British goods and services is extraordinarily strong. So if I, uh, to, to, to kind of paraphrase the famous old quote, and I don't know who originally said it, go west, young man, said somebody on the east coast of America, I would now say, go east, young person. Thank you. Um, 
Lockley, and thank you very much indeed um, for that um, tour de raison. Um, and I don't envy you the huge amount of travel that you have to do on these visits. Sounds absolutely exhausting. Um, just looking at the faces here, um, you have drawn quite a, a premium audience uh, for this address, and I'm sure they are absolutely bursting uh, to ask questions uh, of you. You very kindly agreed to take some questions from the floor. And I wondered if I could invite um, some of the audience members to uh, draw out uh, Lord Green and other points. Yes, gentlemen over there. Thank you. Um, my name is Pete Moforth. Uh, I'm my name is Pete Moforth, and I'm a businessman, and my interest is in trade. Uh, we're an uh, e-commerce company. We look after 26 um, large companies in Scotland. Many of them export to the Far East and, and, and to China. Um, and one of the things that's continuously surprised me is that many of the agencies of government um, uh, very often don't uh, talk about or discuss the role of e-commerce and its contribution here. And just a couple of little points. If you, you can't lie in the modern world in business, you just go to Google and there, there are the stats. If you just type ONS, Office of National Statistics UK 2012, the most recent data, page four, uh, the total e-commerce turnover in the UK is 483 billion. Uh, now given, given that, in, and that's UK government data, not mine, um, and so if that's the size of it, given that our GDP is 1.57 trillion, dividing one by the other, that's 30% of the economy. Uh, it's 30% of the economy, and the ONS say it's growing at 13%, which, which is double the growth rate of China. So I'm not sure what the other 70% is doing. And, 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 and the thing is just the sheer size and scale of e-commerce. I mean, the Scottish economy is smaller than the turnover of a website called Alibaba that a lot of people may not have even, even heard of. That, that in the last year, that's had a turnover of over $200 billion. And that, that unlike the Scottish economy, is growing at 50%. And if you look at all the companies that sell and trade internationally, because e-commerce is simply 21st century trade, there are almost no Scottish companies trading there. So I always understand we, sh we right. should do face-to-face -face business, and we should travel, and we should see, but an awful lot of business is online. Lobby. Well, I agree. <laughs> um, uh, E-commerce is changing uh, the face of the world's economy. It's not just in this country that it's growing rapidly. Uh, in indeed, if you look at the European Union, every single country, the percentage of turnover which is online is rising at a rate of knots year by year. Um, and we've got a job of work to do um, to make sure that there's a real single market in digital services in Europe, uh, as well as encouraging companies to trade through e-commerce uh, more broadly, um, uh, I don't think that's an entire substitute for physical um, uh, uh, business, and indeed it, the evidence is plainly that it's not. At the moment, um, the percentage of cross-border e-commerce trading is way lower than the percentage of total uh, economy that is e-commerce, um, and that's a sign of the work that there is still to be done, I think, which is partly about regulations and within a European context gets quite technical, but things like uh, um, collective rights, uh, management arrangements, uh, do you have to negotiate those in 28 different countries or can you negotiate them at one European level for the 28 markets? Um, uh, and it's partly about getting companies to think carefully about how you design your website. If you design your website entirely for a domestic audience, then largely speaking, it's a domestic audience that will tap it. Um, so it takes you into languages, for instance, as well as kind of cultural norms about how you present things. And indeed, there's a lot of work to be done on e-commerce strategy. And the big attraction of it um, is, of course, apart from anything else, that it does enable companies that uh, are physically distant from each other, or sorry, a, a company to trade with a market that's physically different, uh, dist uh, distant from it, particularly if it's services rather than goods. So uh, th th this is historic and immense, uh, and you're quite right to draw attention to it. Thank you very much indeed. I'll take a question from here, and then the lady over there. The gentleman first. Uh, uh, my name is Martin Sigieri, and I guess I'll speak, uh, I'll speak in my capacity as a former chief executive of Scottish Development International. Uh, founding chief executive of Scottish Development International. I agreed with uh, the vast majority of what you said. I think the opportunities in the ASEAN countries are uh, very exciting, and I think they're a very exciting, uh, very diverse set of countries. I guess the slight difference of emphasis I would put on it is that there's a temptation for 
uh, those in the public sector trying to help companies uh, expand and grow to, to become region or country focused. And if it's, uh, you know, if in, in one period it's India, the next period it's China, then it's ASEAN, it's the BRIC countries generally. Uh, the enthusiasms tend to be geographic as they come and go. I think the appropriate way to think of supporting companies to expand, especially in a small uh, regional economy like Scotland or, or perhaps in future uh, independent national economy, but still a small one, is to think in terms of what the relatively small number of companies uh, we have that have the capacity to be successful internationally uh, might need holistically uh, across their financing needs, their, their people management needs, their uh, internationalization needs, and to devote the appropriate resources to meet those needs so that if you do that, you might end up in a situation where, where notwithstanding the opportunities in ASEAN are very exciting, you might end up sensibly with more of your eggs, a lot more of your eggs in the EU basket or the China basket because those are the, happen to be the best opportunities for the particular set of companies that we are trying to support. Other than that, sort of slight difference of emphasis. I was uh, very encouraged by what you had to say about the ASEAN markets. Uh, well, let me say, I think SDI is a superb organisation. Um, and UK trade and investment work very close. One of the things I'd like to believe that we made a difference to whilst I've been in the job is having UKTI and SDI work very closely together. Um, I, I partly uh, uh, clearly agree. I, I think that, 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 where you, that, that, that helping a company successfully into the export markets is about much more than saying go to country X or Y or Z. That's, of course, true. Um, I set, would not want to be understood as saying ASEAN is the only place that's interesting. I, I, I'm, I've majored on ASEAN partly, partly because I do think it's interesting and partly because Roddy said, why don't you major on ASEAN? Um, but it's one of a uh, series of opportunities around the world. Where, uh, I, the, the bigger theme um, uh, is that these emerging markets generally, uh, and they are large in number and quite widely uh, spread, are opportunities, and, and there, there are actually probably certainly 20 and possibly 40 countries around the world which, which have those characteristics that I mentioned, not least the fact that they are genuinely looking for more British engagement. They actually do want to see more of us, and they specifically criticise us that there are fewer of our British businesses, whether it's Scottish or UK-wide, compared with what they see from France or Italy. So I, I think we have to take that message um, the, the, and indeed, the statistics show that fewer British companies export than is the European average. We, I think, can't quite duck the significance of that. Um, and there are many reasons why it's true, of course. Uh, but nevertheless, we can't, I think, rest content, any of us, whilst it's still true that we have a relatively less internationalised economy, north and south of the border, uh, than the European average. Uh, I do, uh, with one other thing you said, I do agree with, by the way, in all of the talk of emerging markets, we should never forget the attractions of the European Union. <laughs> um, before I move on, I might draw you a, a, a little bit more on that question and that answer, and that is, what is it that you feel that even the French and the Italians are doing that we are not in terms of building up their export trade? Do yeah. they have more um, SDI-type trade missions uh, out of these countries? What is it that they do that seems to be giving them a foothold in that we are not doing. Well, let me first say, it. I think the good news is I think this is beginning to shift now. Uh, there have been a lot of um, surveys recently that have shown more and more British businesses. British Chambers of Commerce have done it, uh, the IOD have done it, the uh, CBI have done it, um, and some private sector, the, the Barclays showed a producer, a very interesting survey. And survey after survey essentially also is the same thing, that more and more British businesses are now looking at the export markets, both in the European Union, for those that have never gone anywhere before, and, and further afield. So I think, uh, and this is partly, I think, the work of the SDI and its equivalents in other parts of the UK, um, I, I think it's beginning to show fruit. But it's a long-term project, this. Uh, I can safely say that in all of our working careers, of all of us here present, uh, Britain has suffered from a weak trade position. Um, uh, in most years since the 1960s, Britain has run a trade deficit. In most years since the 1960s, trade has been a drag on growth instead of a contributor to growth. And so one of the things I find myself saying to ministers and anybody will listen, um, including you, <laughs> uh, is that this is something that is a marathon. Uh, it'll take time to fix. Uh, and we do actually do need collectively to keep at it over a probably 20-year period. 
Um, but, I, but I also believe it's a marathon that we can complete because if you look at our basic ability to compete successfully across a wide range of sectors, we are a broad-based economy. Um, uh, and even if we're talking Scotland only, I don't think we should say we're a narrow economy dependent only on oil and gas and financial services. not true. We're a broad-based economy. Um, and in essentially all of the sectors, there's obvious demand. I, I, uh, anecdote, I was in Shanghai a few months ago, called on the Johnny Walker store there. Um, it's unbelievable what they will pay for kind of tailor-made bottles of Johnny Walker in Shanghai. Um, so we shouldn't think about high-tech stuff. Uh, we shouldn't think about you know, very, very modern 21st century kind of, it's, uh, the, the traditional industries as well have a great deal of potential around the world. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, the lady here, thank you. Oh, thanks very much. My name is, Chris oh, that's rather a blast, that's working, working you all up. My name is Christine Richard. Um, I, I suppose I'm a polymath. I've had a long career in uh, education, which I want to ask you about, but also in politics as an elected local government member though I have tried to get into the Scottish Parliament, but I'm not very good at um, bowing my own held views to those of the party whip, so I'm not much good at that. But I have been the leader of the opposition in Edinburgh Council. That's just to set the scene. This has been a parallel, in fact, with a career in business studies lecturing in further education and a little bit in higher education. Now, education point with all this need, which I recognize and I, I think is absolutely crucial to our future development, we have to have an education system which will equip our young people to take opportunities to have the skills to do the jobs of in infrastructure building, for example, which is a good one to take, so that they can actually have something valuable to offer and I see that we have the principal of Edinburgh University here today, being very quiet at the moment. Because I, but I do know that he does wonderful work getting students from all parts of the world. And I think this exchange of education information is where we need to grow. And as a final word, I have just had an idea whilst I was listening to you, I do get them sometimes, that would it be a good idea for large successful companies who are already exporting to have smaller medium-sized enterprises piggyback on them so that they can work together so that the smaller will grow into the bigger and together they can export not only goods and services but education and mores into these growing markets. I could say a lot more but I'm being frowned at so I won't. <laughs> piggyback rides. Piggyback rides. Yeah. Well, I, yes, I do think that there's plenty of opportunity for the for the major companies to work with their own supply chain. Uh, and indeed, one of the exciting things that we have been doing, and I was in Aberdeen yesterday at the Offshore Europe Convention, uh, uh, is uh, working, UKTI, that is, working with Shell in a series of countries uh, to do precisely what you've, what you've just talked about, which is helping their own supply chain get into those markets for uh, offshore um, technological expertise and so forth. More generally, uh, I think education is both a major export in its own right, uh, with huge growth potential, and also, of course, uh, of immense, uh, probably incalculable, indirect value. I mentioned the case of the Vietnamese Prime Minister and his fellow ministers. I don't know how you put a value on the fact that their children are at British universities. Um, the long-term uh, relationship building that that does for us um, is, uh, is, is enormous. Um, by way of one other quick example, um, uh, the, uh, from my previous incarnation, the Chinese banking regulator, um, uh, now retired, uh, but when I was in my uh, previous job, the Chinese banking regulator had done a uh, period of time at the London School of Economics, spoke fluent English with an I'm going to say English accent, British accent, um, but in any case, not an American one. Um, and again, the, the kind of warmth of that, and did that mean he bent his regulations for us? No, of course not. But, but the relation, you can see how this works, and the value of education over the long term is, I, I don't think it needs explaining to any of you. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, time is running out very fast. So I'm going to take a series of like machine gun questions, please. Very short questions and very short answers to bring it to a conclusion. Um, I'll take you first, and then I'll take you second. Yes, thank you. 
uh, Crawford, Crawford Gillis, Scottish Enterprise. A uh, couple of quick comments. Firstly, to absolutely endorse everything you've been saying. Uh, secondly, on the education opportunity, uh, my d dear colleague on my right may have something else to say about this in a second, but um, the opportunity is huge. We actually have 11 Scottish higher education institutes uh, visiting Indonesia uh, next week, just as an example of what's going on, and we need to see a lot yeah. more of, yeah. uh, of that. In terms of getting SMEs involved, surveys uh, show, uh, surveys of companies that have started exporting uh, show that they before they export, they overestimate the costs and the hassle of export, and they underestimate the benefits. And I think in addition to getting large corporates to work with, with smaller companies, we need to, to do more to promote those companies that are already out there and get them to actually communicate the benefits and the, uh, the, the, the costs. Because while well, the public sector has an important role, whether it's UKTI, uh, SDI, et cetera, Getting companies to talk to companies actually in so yeah. many ways can be so much more powerful. I agree completely with that. And this is where e-commerce can play an important part because we've established a thing called Open to Export, a kind of platform under UKTI's auspices, which is precisely designed to do that, have companies tell their own stories to other companies. There's nothing more powerful than companies telling them what, what it feel like in country X selling wine. Okay. Um, a quick fire question from the gentleman here and one final one from the gentleman there on the... You first, and then the last one from Matt. Sure, yeah. okay. Very uh, quick. Uh, Tim O'Shea, oh. University of Edinburgh. We've got you next. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Be quick. We've got two, two and a half thousand students whose first language is Mandarin or Cantonese from PRC, um, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore. Um, but you're part of, we would have had more, but for your government, and but for its uh, policy on uh, student visas. And... We would, have had, we would have many more of our students staying uh, from, those, from those countries working, but for the fact that you're part of a government that has made it very, very difficult for those students to right. get work permits. Okay, thank you. Do you want to... Uh, yeah, take the question. On that, I, I, I recognise the point, and I wondered whether we'd get through this session without the point being made. <laughs> but uh, but uh, actually, the truth is there are no limits on uh, student visas. Um, uh, there's a language test, yes. Uh, and actually, since we were talking about uh, China, you know, the numbers are up and not down. The numbers are down from the subcontinent, but they're up from everywhere else. Uh, and yes, there are issues about work permits, and yes, they've got tightened up. It's in the context of a wider approach, uh, which uh, we could spend 15 minutes on the rationale for. But the intent is to make it as user-friendly within the context of a control on immigration, which wasn't there before, uh, to, to, to make it as easy as possible for students to come here. Right. Okay, thank you. Right. One uh, question there. Sure. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the name is Gong Hua Yu. Uh, I used to be an academic lecturing in university, now turning into an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, on, on education, actually, just a quick point. Um, I think education export is uh, a huge success uh, in UK. I think the export of degrees um, mm. uh, is huge well. success, certainly. But I personally, having lectured in university, I have a concern on the quality of the degrees. And I think that is being recognized to be a problem in China, at least. I don't know whether you've heard anything traveling across, uh, across uh, East Asia. I'm sure there are very good students, no doubt, very good universities, but there are also concerns on the quality of degree, UK degrees. Have you heard anything of that sort of talk? I, I haven't heard that. I think that's interesting. Um, I mean, Britain is the second most popular destination for Chinese students, as you, I'm sure, know, after the U.S. In fact, I mean, so close that considering the difference in population of the U.S. and the U.K., it's a remarkable success story. I must say I haven't heard that. And uh, if it were true, uh, we'd have to look to our laurels because it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big proposition. And uh, I'd be interested maybe afterwards in picking up a bit of the chapter and verse that you've got in mind. Um, although making the obvious point at the end of the day, this is for the universities themselves to address, obviously. Thank you. The back. Um, I'm William Lucas, a uh, mining financier operating most of the, the countries you mentioned here this morning. If you're foolhardy enough to go to North Korea, the government of South Korea will underwrite your exploration expenditures if it turns that the government is throwing you out. Uh, there's a practical example of the largest tungsten deposit in the world in Vietnam, 
which was funded in London to the tune of several hundred million, are being nationalized summarily by the government of Vietnam. <coughs> My real question is whether Her Majesty's government would consider underrating expenditures incurred uh, by British companies who then find themselves being expropriated of their licenses or literally turfed out on their own. I think what uh, a company in that sort of position should do, but, but, but in advance and not ex post, is talk to ex UK Export Finance, who exist to help de-risk the financial aspects of doing business in emerging markets. Now, there are some things they can and some things they can't do, and the details would matter, but we have actually, I don't know whether you want to stand up, a colleague of mine from UK Export Finance who would be very happy to, to, to talk to you on chapter and verse. <laughs> very bad. Thank you very much, Nick. Lord Green, you're in Scotland. We're going to wring you dry. One final one. Thank you. Good afternoon, Lord Green. David Scott, the Mongolian Honorary Consul for Scotland. <coughs> Mine's not a question. You'll be pleased to hear it. It's very short. In fact, two, just two points I wanted to raise, which would be of interest generally to the audience, <laughs> and both are, are specific to Scotland and Asian trade. One is that the tremendous success we've had uh, this year, the Mongolians performed at the Edinburgh Tattoo, which to many people will just be a festival of, of military marching and bands, but it's so much more, as I've learned over the last two months. Uh, it, with David at the helm, we've, we've seen uh, Mongolian business delegates attend Edinburgh. They've never been here before, uh, in the Kashmir industry and others. Uh, the Mongolian embassy have been so impressed uh, with what's going on. They are sending, uh, via the Mongolian Chamber of Commerce, Newland Batter, 10 Mongolian businesses to Scotland for the first ever Mongolian-Scottish trade mission. This will be in November. So that's the first success, and I, I would urge everybody to, uh, to look at the tattoo as a lot more th than they'd see it as, because it's, it's a real vehicle for success. Um, the second point is, is even quicker. Um, in my private life, I do business in Indonesia, and uh, I don't know if you're aware, uh, in Jakarta we have one of the biggest St. Andrews societies in the world, and the second biggest Highland Games in the world. And I'm all for novel solutions, as the tattoo has shown me, well, the second biggest Highland Games in the world is in Jakarta, and surely that's a vehicle for Scottish trade. Absolutely right. And that's me. Thank you. Absolutely right. <laughs> okay, I'll call on um, Roddy uh, Garrett to uh, wind up for us. Excellent. Thank you. Um, my name is Brian Lang, and I'm wearing um, several hats in thanking Lauren Green. First, I'm, as, a, as a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, I, I see several fellow fellows in the room. And I think it's very appropriate that the Royal Society of Edinburgh is the location for meetings like this. Um, I also speak as a member of the Advisory Council to the Asia Scotland Institute. And Lauren Green, you described rightly the, the early role played by Scots in creating trade relations with, with Southeast Asia. But of course, that was, in some cases, hundreds of years ago, and the world has changed significantly since then. And the competition that we face, as you described from the French, Italians, Germans, Americans, is now intense. So if we're going to do business in Asia, we must be prepared to deal with that competition. We can no longer take our role as Scots for granted. So much of trade is about relationships. And one of the aims of the Asia Scotland Institute is to ensure that no stone is left unturned in ensuring that we are properly prepared to create these relationships, which is very much, much a matter of understanding the countries with whom we want to do business and the culture and mores of the people with whom we will do that business. Edu executive education plays a role here, and I've been discussing with Roddy Gao the the sort of appropriate edu uh, executive education which will best prepare Scots on the one hand and our partners on the other in these countries for, 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 for doing business together. Um, I'm a great believer in e-commerce, but no trade agreement is ever concluded on the basis of an email alone. We work face to face. It's essential to look people in the eye. And I'm delighted, that you're, I'm delighted that you're working so hard, touring seven countries in 10 days, to ensure that these face-to-face these, that these -face relationships are, are, are being nurtured. So Lord Green, thank you very much for what you have been here in Edinburgh to do. Um, Bill, if I can thank you for your customary elegance in chairing this meeting, although you had quite an easy time given the 
Absolutely. the elegant and, and, and articulate nature of the audience. But Lord Green, thank you for your, 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 your information. Thank you for your guidance. And we hope you will continue to, to serve Scotland well in, in world relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done.